On April 20th, 2011, a mysterious force took down Sony PlayStation Network and Curiosity after months of a brutal fight between the conglomerate and its customers. Millions of subscribers worldwide lived with the threat of identity theft for almost a month while the culprits remained at large. And lurking in the background of it all was the network known as Anonymous, and one of the most prolific hackers of the modern age, a man called Geohot. When the dust settled, over $171 million would be lost, and a slew of new regulations would forever change online commerce. This is the story of the PlayStation Network hack. I'd say my cause is to, you know, if companies want to put these security measures on these devices, great, good for them. But if we want to come in and we want to remove these security measures so we can do legal things with our devices, then I think we have every right to, and I guess that's my cause. To understand the events, let's look at a young hacker who put a face to a movement, George Hotz, known online, of course, as GeoHot. At the end of June 2007, Apple made history with their new product, the iPhone, the mobile device that revolutionized communication in cell phones. I mean, think about pre-iPhone. We carried around some real goofy looking products before this came along. There was one small problem. If you were located in the United States and wanted to take part of the digital bliss of Apple's flagship product, you had to use AT&T as your service provider. This didn't sit right with 17-year-old George Hotz. He wanted the phone, of course, everybody did, but he didn't want to give up his affordable T-Mobile plan. So what could this kid do about it? First off, Hotz wasn't any ordinary teen. At this point in his early life, he was already an accomplished engineer and tech guru that had been featured on shows like Today with Katie Couric, and despite his young years, he was running circles around his seniors. With such a keen mind for tech and a rebellious streak to go with it, George made a decision. Instead of being forced to switch networks, the New Jersey native took a precision screwdriver and guitar pick to pop open the back of his iPhone and got to work. For him, it was simple. He just had to override the commands to the baseband processor by soldering a chip to the wire and scrambling its code. Then he created a program on his PC to allow the iPhone to use any carrier and installed the software. In less than three months, Hotz reverse engineered the device it took years to build. He became the first person to jailbreak an iPhone. And despite his high level of intelligence, he then did what any other teenager would do, publish the victory on YouTube. The tech world went wild, while Steve Jobs for once had very little to say. Steve Wozniak, Apple co-founder and actual genius depending on who you ask, praised Hotz, calling him a creative instead of a criminal. For the next few years, GeoHot became the darling of the hacker community, putting out videos on jailbreaking iPhones without any challenge from the industry leader. Some thought he was doing the tech giants a favour, since more people might buy the phone without switching networks, and perhaps this was true. This gave our young prodigy a history of ripping things open and making their work the way he wanted, which often wasn't the way the creator intended. Even before the iPhone, he was doing this just in his life out of curiosity. In an interview with his father, he said that the kid would constantly rip open remote controls and appliances to just learn how they worked. As a student, he hacked his school computers to play Beethoven's Ninth. It seemed by all accounts, Hotz had, from an early age, one of the most valuable assets a human can possess. An insatiable curiosity. And now, he had the whole internet encouraging him to go to the next level. The donations from his iPhone jailbreak program gave him enough money to fund a cross-country trek from the East Coast to the Google headquarters in California. The young Hots dropped out of college to follow the path of every tech leader to stake out his claim in the Wild West known as Silicon Valley. But it didn't take long for boredom to set in. While Google might have been quirky compared to other jobs, it was still a rigid corporate structure, one that didn't excite someone with George's abilities. He was now done with the internet fame and attention from jailbreaking, now done with Google too, and he moved back home to Jersey announcing his retirement from hacking phones. It was the end of an era, but really, just like the iPhone, Hotz was about to upgrade. As he got home, he received a package containing a simple challenge, hack the PS3. To this point, he'd been successful and comfortable living off his exploits for the past few years, but that was the problem. He was comfortable, and clearly, nothing bothered George quite like living in safety. He made a career out of risk, and this challenge lit the fire back in his soul. So in 2010, 
the hacker announced his glorious return with his new goal to hack the PS3. At this stage in 2010, seventh generation video game consoles were considered appliances. The big three, Nintendo Wii, Microsoft Xbox 360 and Sony PlayStation 3 were brand names as big as Coke and Pepsi. You were almost expected to have one of the big three available in your home. But for the hardcore gaming crowd, having a piece of equipment as is wouldn't cut it. The tech inside the consoles was much more sophisticated than ever before, but the secrets within belonged to manufacturers. The machines were impressive, but they were artificially limited. Enter the home brewer, part hacker, part programmer. These people blurred the lines between PC and console gamers. They hacked the hardware to access hidden features and run pirated copies of games or backups as they were called. They could also mod games, create background themes, and make consoles another computer essentially. But until now, the PS3 remained untouched, even in this elite community. So with the gauntlet thrown down, Hot returned to the tools that made him infamous, his screwdriver and soldering iron. He laboured into the late night for over five weeks, creating a string of code 500 lines long on his PC. If this code worked, then his screen would flash zero. If it didn't, it would display five. This was the moment. Was it all bluster, or was Hotz the real thing? He began the sequence and held his breath. The screen flashed. He waited. Seconds stretched unnaturally, and then he got his answer. The screen flashed again with the single number, zero. He had done the impossible, again. And just like before, he went online to flaunt the accomplishment. No video this time, just a single line of text. I have hacked the PS3. He called his massive code Finnegan's Wake and distribute the instructions online for others to replicate his success. Hotz exploited a program running on the PS3 called Other OS. It allowed the system to run Linux, the preferred operating system of homebrewers and computer nerds everywhere. When Hotz successfully hacked the hardware, he turned it from a single purpose video game console into a desktop computer, allowing others like him to write their own programs. But unlike Apple, Sony didn't stay silent, they didn't praise him. They would not let some kid from New Jersey get the better of them. They issued a corrective patch to stop other hackers from exploiting the system's weakness. People were used to playing Sony games, but now Sony had created a new game, a game of cat and mouse. The homebrew community responded, and they were not happy. This patch ended their free reign over the PS3, a move that they called absolute madness. And Geohot, at the centre of it all, became a divisive figure. This was a world he'd helped create, and so some held in him as the messiah of that world. Others went the opposite route, and wanted him stopped at all costs. This resulted in his personal information being posted online, known otherwise as doxing. Phone number, real name, address. He was now a much more public figure, whether he liked it or not. Regardless, one thing was for sure, Sony's patch wouldn't stop him from getting back into the system. After all, in his words, his whole life is a hack. But how would he do it this time? Hotz always thought of hacking as a tool of persuasion. If he could find a way to manipulate the system, he could convince it to do whatever he wanted. Last time he used that logic to create code that forced his way in, now he had a different tactic. Why force control when he could convince the PS3 to give him control instead? In January 2011, Hotz used his decryption program on a different part of the console to reveal the access key to override the patch. It took him weeks to jailbreak the PS3 on the first try. The second time around, the PS3 submitted to his will in under 10 minutes. But this time, he paused for consideration. He knew the moment his patch released, Sony would again fix the vulnerability. Something needed to change. And so before he gave the code away again, he placed a special feature to stop the console from playing pirated games. Well, they can't use my stuff with pirated video games. I made, a, I made a special effort when I released my stuff to not support pirated video games, but more pressing than that is just the immensity of the press and, you know, attention Sony has brought to this issue that has never affected more than a very small segment of their customers. This, he thought, probably correctly, was Sony's biggest issue. Of course, others could have deactivated his feature if they knew how, but after Sony's wrath came down last time, he wanted to show a little good faith to the conglomerate. He then released his version of the hack to the world again, and it was very popular. Now of course while others claimed to jailbreak the PS3 before HOTS, he was undoubtedly the one to brag most brazenly as he did. The others were ghosts. 
He, Hot, had a blog. He reveled in the attention. Despite his goodwill, Sony were done now. They knew they could patch again and he would continue to break it. The cat and mouse game was over. Instead, they set their legal team to follow the breadcrumb trail of cheese, leading them directly to Hots and his loyal supporters. This of course wasn't hard, Hots was loud, and on January 11th, 2011, Sony sued Hots and some of his cohorts for violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and of course facilitating copyright infringement. Now the battle lines were being drawn. George Hotz might have been listed as a defendant, but the message was very clear. It was bigger than him. Sony were now saying, in no uncertain terms, if you buy a PS3, you buy it and use it as is, or we will come for you. Hacktivists called this a violation of First Amendment rights. After all, who's to say how you use anything after you buy it? Del Monte doesn't bust down your door after you slice up one of their pineapples and put it on a pizza. So why was Sony different? What gave them the right to say how you can use a product that you purchased? But they claimed of course it was a copyright issue. Hotz's attempt to stop pirated games from playing on the system did not impress or stop them. Sony claimed that as long as the system could be hacked, it opened the door to piracy and that was enough. They stated that ripped games cost the industry around $8 billion annually, and the legal team argued that they weren't just protecting their intellectual property, but also protecting consumers as well. Potts did not see it this way. He made his case publicly, appearing on G4, which, if you're too young to remember, was like CNN for gaming. So then what, what do you think the issue is? What exactly are you being sued for here? Making Sony mad. Ah, well that, that'll do it. He joked around with the hosts about the situation, he even put out a one minute diss track on his YouTube channel. Yo, it's Geo High. And for those that don't know, I'm getting sued by Sony. He made fun of Sony and called himself the personification of freedom for all, challenging them to use this video as evidence at the trial. Geo Hot, of course, wasn't taking the situation seriously. Yet. It was clear now that neither side was going to back down. But Sony was publicly mostly quiet. They weren't looking to win the meme wars. Despite what the internet thinks, the court of public opinion is irrelevant when the law is involved. Their plan was of course to dominate the courts. And they were. It started with a successful restraining order placed on Hotz. He could no longer, by law, hack the PS3 and publish his exploits and findings online. But Sony smelled blood in the water, so why stop there? They subpoenaed Twitter, Google, YouTube, and Hotz's internet provider, as well as the IP addresses of anyone who downloaded the hack instructions. They were even granted access to Hotz's PayPal records, finding anyone who donated money to him. Essentially, anyone who gave Hotz money, attention, likes, views, or downloaded his products were just as guilty as him in Sony's eyes. This overreach stunned the world. It was undoubtedly going to set a terrifying precedent, but according to the courts, it was valid. Each decision was upheld legally. There was one group on the internet, however, who said enough is enough. They saw these actions for what they were, acts of war. Hotz was no longer alone in this fight. Now, a new challenger entered the arena. The mysterious group Anonymous has struck again with a warning. This is just the beginning. Anonymous is one of the biggest online vigilante groups. Members hack into companies and governments. Greetings, citizens of the world. This is a message from Anonymous. Anonymous, the most notorious and secretive hacker collective on Earth. And in their words, they are legion. Angered by Sony's actions against their consumers and the abuse of power, the group issued an ominous and disturbing threat. Congratulations Sony, you've now received the undivided attention of Anonymous. You saw a hornet's nest, and you stuck your penises in it. You must face the consequences of your actions, Anonymous style. As cringe as that statement comes off, Anonymous started to follow through. On April 4th, the hacker collective took down Sony.com and PlayStation.com just hours after their bizarre press release. The group took responsibility in a subsequent YouTube video and issued their demands. Anonymous is currently targeting Sony's website. We are doing this because Sony is currently suing people for making features the PlayStation originally had available to the public. Leave Geohot and the other hackers alone. Let them continue to hack the PS3 freely, or there would be more to come. At this point, despite the swagger Geohot displayed a few months prior, this wasn't the kind of help he wanted. He feared that Anonymous and their army could anger Sony even more 
maybe even implicating him in their attacks. And he was of course right to be afraid. While you could argue about how he made a living, everything Hotz did was in the light of day. His methods were an open book for anyone to see online. But Anonymous is literally called Anonymous. They're secretive, militant, and decentralized. Without a clear leader or structure, they were free to attack Sony at will using whatever tools they had available. Literally anybody could claim to be anonymous and do anything, co-opting the messaging and the group to essentially do whatever they wanted. Some, of course, would go further than others without consideration of the repercussions on anyone else associated. One such faction of the shadowy group doxed Sony executives, posting the addresses and names of their family members. Some of Anonymous even wanted to take the fight to the judge in the case, where of course most of them just wanted to do something juvenile like shit in a bag and leave it at the CEO of Sony's doorstep. It was of course chaos without any clear direction. Hotz at this stage rushed to avoid stepping in more shit, reaching a settlement agreement with Sony on April 11th. The young hacker agreed never to homebrew another PS3 or any of their other products ever again. Even though Hotz agreed to this injunction, bowing out of the situation, his supporters did not back down. It might have began with Hotz, but it was now going to end with Anonymous, and they were ready to go even further. On April 13th, Anonymous released another video, calling for a day of Sony protest. This is an update on the current operation, Operation Sony. Giahot has taken a settlement with Sony. The case has been dropped. In the eyes of the law, the case is closed. For Anonymous it is just beginning. This April 16th, grab your mask, a few friends, and get to a local Sony store by you. Use the IRC and the official Facebook page to organize a protest in your area. That weekend, many Sony stores in the United Kingdom decided to close to play it safe. The Manchester location even had police waiting out front, just in case things got out of hand. In California, one protester plastered flyers until they were asked to leave by mall security, but that's kind of it. As with most consumer-based protests, it came and went without much fuss. Clearly, if Anonymous wanted to hurt Sony, it couldn't be in the real world. That is not where Anonymous conducted their best work. So instead, they returned to the shadows. And on April 17th, employees at Sony noticed something abnormal about their servers. The machines kept rebooting without authorization. This activity continued for the next two days, and while teams within the company worked frantically to investigate the root cause of the problems, they had no clue what was going on. It wasn't until April 19th that Sony realized somebody was hacking their servers. The problem here went beyond gaming. It wasn't just that the service was down for paying customers. This was an unfathomable escalation. Whoever was inside their system now had access to 77 million PSN subscriber accounts their passwords, personal information, and potentially even their credit card data. With a breach like this in full effect for almost three days, Sony had to take drastic action to prevent further damage. On April 20th, Sony took down the PlayStation Network, leaving millions without paid service. They didn't tell the public what was happening, instead leaving a brief message on their blog. Quote, We are aware certain functions of PlayStation Network are down. We'll report back here as soon as we can with more information. Thank you for your patience. As you can imagine, this didn't help anybody. Rumours were swirling online immediately. Was Anonymous really making good on their threats? The next day, the servers were still down. And once again, Sony begged for patience from their customers, saying it could be around 48 hours to fix the mess. On April 22nd, Sony finally admitted to quote, an external intrusion but they failed to mention the possibility of the data breach. I'm sure, of course, it just skipped their mind. While the internet buzzed and gamers fumed, Sony employees worked long hours to rebuild their network infrastructure. They even hired two outside cybersecurity firms to analyze and assist with the situation. Surprisingly, despite all their rants and threats, Anonymous denied hacking the PSN. They said a few rogue members could have caused it, but suggested the problem ultimately was likely the servers themselves. This, of course, is why Anonymous as a concept is so dangerous. There was no structure. It was not a body operating as one, the left hand didn't know what the right was doing, or more accurately, it didn't even know the right hand even existed. Sony eventually found a file on one of their servers with the name Anonymous, 
It contained the signature catchphrase, We are Legion, a calling card confirming what everyone originally assumed. Anonymous, whether they knew it or not, was behind the attack. This was the perfect storm of incompetence, irresponsibility and lies. Four days later, Sony finally advised their customers that their credit card data could be at risk, although there was no evidence of theft. But no matter how they tried to play it down, the news had a devastating effect. Sony shares dropped in value day after day, investors were losing confidence in the tech giant. And then came the irony. Where Sony had previously brought legal action against the young man for his actions, the shoe was now on the other foot. A class action lawsuit had been filed against Sony, seeking compensation and free credit card monitoring services due to Sony's failure to act and protect their customers' data. At this stage, Hotz, of course, made sure to cover his bases, uploading a video calling the hack uncalled for, even if it's aimed at the bad guys. He wasn't taking any chances with being implicated this time. Cut to May 2nd, the network still remained closed. According to a Sony press release, thousands of credit card numbers could have been accessed. No matter how hard they tried, no amount of spin could stop the company from spiralling. It wasn't until May 14th that the service finally came back online, at least for some people, as it took them nearly two days for engineers to restore the PSN country by country. After 23 days, the nightmare finally came to an end. Well, for the customers anyway. For Sony, they were about to meet the final boss in this fight. Worse than any shadow a hacker group or angry home brewer, worse even than the angry investors and consumers. Now Sony faced the wrath of the United States Congress. A subcommittee of the US House launched an investigation into the cybercrimes occurring at Sony, concerned mainly with their lack of action leading up to the attacks. After all, they'd literally been threatened, they knew this could have happened, why were they not prepared for when it did? After verifying what information was at risk, Sony claimed they acted when they could and notified customers once they had all the facts. When asked about the credit card data, they claimed those numbers remained encrypted, but that wasn't the case for literally everything else, and that included passwords. So while credit card data was safe, according to Sony, hackers now had access to details that could see hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of accounts hacked as a result, putting even more data at risk if people were to have used those passwords across multiple services. Across the pond, the British Information Commissioner Office also had a formal investigation into Sony. They found that the company breached the UK's Data Protection Act of 1998, saying that technology was their stock and trade, and as such, the fact they didn't see it coming or stop it from happening was inexcusable. The UK fined them a measly $395,000. Sony, of course, had a long way to make it up to their customers, whose goodwill had all been burned. They pledged to provide insurance up to $1 million for anyone who was the victim of credit card fraud or identity theft. Since customers lost about one month of service, they gave out 30 days free for PSN Plus subscribers. They even let gamers choose two free games to download from a very limited selection. But forget Sony for a moment, because no amount of gifts could undo the damage they'd done to an entire industry. It was the most significant data breach of its time and undermined confidence in online security. More revealing, the events leading up to the hack showed Sony's priorities were games and proprietary rights, and not consumers. The breach showed the weakness of a megacorporation's servers, their hubris regarding the powers of a small but determined group of hackers, and of course consumer rights. But at the end of it all, did Sony learn their lesson from any of this? Realistically, if there was justice in the world, Sony would have suffered much harsher consequences for what they tried to do with the overreaching legal war, and of course for their flagrant disregard of customer data. But months later, they gained over 3 million new PSN subscribers and went on to grow larger year on year. Even after being found objectively wrong by multiple government bodies across the globe, it's doubtful to say Sony ever learned any meaningful lesson from their situation. The hackers were the ones who eventually learned their lesson, though that wouldn't happen for some months and is a story for an entirely different video altogether.